our aims for dietary management would be control of sugars, control of lipids, control of the weight. And for that, lifestyle changes in all forms, exercise will work. There is restriction of the calorie amount. So based on the patient's BMI, the body weight, how much the calorie should be. It's a good idea to discuss with the dietitian and find out what uh, general guideline you can give. And for a specific kind of diet, you send them to the dietitian. So what kind of carbohydrates are being used? Complex carbohydrates break down slower. So complex carbohydrates won't increase the blood sugar as much. And the quality, the types so of things that are too refined will increase the sugar a lot faster and how much you're taking. So the, uh, the amount of carbohydrates in the diet also need to be checked, need to be reduced. The sugar intake or sugary substance intake Sugar, honey, and jaggery equal culprits when it comes to diabetes. Something that one needs to remember very strictly and needs to remind the patient. There's a lot of misinformation on television, on WhatsApp, everywhere. There are people talking about using brown sugar or jaggery or honey instead of sugar. They are carbohydrates too. Sucrose or fructose, whatever it is, will go into your body, will break down and convert into glucose. So if your body is not metabolizing sugar well, it's not going to metabolize honey or jaggery well either. So please, please remind your patients about that. A lot of times you will find you've given the right medicines, you've given the advice, yet the patients are not reaching glycemic targets because they have actually stopped taking sugar, but they're taking equal or more quantity of jaggery, brown sugar or um, honey instead. So that needs to be remembered. There needs to be adequate protein and fiber. So people who are very non-vegetarians, they won't really get much benefit from suddenly becoming a vegetarian because the protein intake needs to be there. The fiber intake needs to be there. So for vegetarian patients, remind them about having dals and rajma and lots of nuts and seeds. For uh, non-vegetarian patients, tell them that yes, your lean chicken is good. Your lean fish is good. The only thing is that you need to make sure that it's cooked in a way which takes the nutrient component out and adds in more of carbohydrates and fats in it. So uh, discuss about diet properly when it comes to these things. Modify the fat intake. Replace saturated fatty acids with polyunsaturated ones and monounsaturated ones. But then at the end of the day, no fat is 100% good. No fat is 100% bad. So it can't really tell the patients, um, yes, you can change over to olive oil that way. It doesn't really work. Intake of things like ghee and butter, which are by the nature of the product, saturated fats, that needs to reduce. So you can't keep on taking all these fats and expect the sugar and the lipid control to be okay. And the meals need to be spaced. So a lot of discussion goes on about different kinds of fasting. If you don't give your body food at the correct intervals, the body tends to hold on to whatever it gets. So if you have a very heavy breakfast and then nothing throughout the day and something at dinner, throughout the day, the metabolism is going to be all over the place and the sugar control will not be good. That is why we've seen during religious festivals like Navratri, like Ramzan, like Lent, we tend to find diabetics going all out of control. So that's why spacing of meals is important and our patients during the religious festivals, we need to actually modify their treatment, modify their medicines, try to remind them that something needs to be done so that they don't go entirely uh, without an entire meal throughout the day, something which will ensure that they're getting good fiber and protein throughout the day so that the insulin surge is not too much. And then at the same time, there is no sudden increase in glucose either. So healthy eating plans, we need to plan and keep the BMI and HbA1c at a target level. So BMI should be within 24.9. HbA1c should be preferably less than 5.7. And someone who's already diabetic, try to keep it between 6.4 to 7 at the max. There is no one size fits all here either. So every person is an individual. Their calorie intake will be very specific depending on their current weight, depending on the target BMI. So you need to be a little uh, individualized when it comes to diet discussion. There needs to be personalized plans for food preferences and lifestyle and culture. So you cannot really insist that a vegetarian suddenly start eating lean chicken. And at the same time, you cannot insist that someone who has a diet based 
on a certain thing, totally stop taking that. So somehow modifying according to their food preferences and culture. So the essential components would be like we've already discussed whole grains, complex carbohydrates, good amount of fiber, lean proteins, lots of green vegetables and limit amount of heart healthy fats uh, like uh, almonds and walnuts. There are some totally safe foods in diabetes. So these foods people actually can take as to as many amount as they want and it will not affect their sugar or their sugar metabolism. So you can just have a look at this little chart, cabbage, cauliflower, leaf vegetables, tomatoes, cucumbers, all different kinds of gourd, buttermilk without sweet in it and lime juice without sweet in it. So the key words here are unsweetened. Huh? So a ready packaged buttermilk or a ready sweetened Packaged lime juice is not a good idea. Something made at home will work better. So now we come to drugs. So if you look at this chart, there are so many different drugs which take care of diabetes. But A, we always need to remember that unless there is any reason not to start with metformin. Metformin works best when given it helps in weight loss. It has almost negligible uh, possibility of, have, of someone having hypoglycemia and tell that to your patient. Patients are very scared of starting diabetes medicine because they're scared of hypoglycemia. So tell them that metformin usually will not give you hypoglycemia. Just remember not to skip your meals entirely and take it at the correct time, but still there is really no problem with it. Then there are different insulin sensitizers like metformin, but work in a different manner on the PPAR format. We have uh, these saroglitazar, which also works very well on triglycerides. Sulfonylureas, like we discussed, was one of the first uh, oral medicines that we'd found. There are different other kind of secretor drugs which work on DP4, which works on GLP-1. And we've got these uh, specific things, glucosidase inhibitors that works on postprandial glucose especially. We've got SGLT2 inhibitors that helps in flushing out excess of sugar. So our choices are huge and so many different kinds of combinations are also available. So it takes a lot of time to understand all of these. So try and find out the ones that are used commonly, the ones that you use commonly and read up about it, read up about the side effects. And all. So be aware, patients will ask you about side effects and you should be upfront with side effects too. Tell them that, yes, this can happen, but this we will take care of. That is the difference between modern medicine and other fields of medicines that we can actually, we, we have the guts and the information to tell our patients about the possible side effects, which will probably not be that bad. So the commonly used drugs, again, metformin, why do we prefer it so much? Because it conserves beta cell function. There is no hypoglycemia. There is some weight loss. We can go to up to 3000 milligrams per day. So that's quite a high dose. And even if in mild kidney dysfunction where the creatine is up to 1.8, we can still use that. Problems are, yes, there might be a little bit of bloating because of the, uh, the way the medicine works. Not so safe if there is a frank liver dysfunction, but till uh, fatty liver stage three it still can be used. And in very rare cases, lactic acidosis can happen. All these sulfonyl ureas have the same problem that they use up your beta cells. So at the beginning, they can give a good benefit, but then later on, one would see that they don't work too well anymore. So use it thinking about a lot of things. Yes, the uh, sulfonyl ureas are a lot cheaper and easily available. So in a small dose, you actually can give it to many patients, but then it does lead to a lot of weight gain. So keep that in mind. And it can lead to hypoglycemia, especially if one skips a meal. So these little points keep in mind. If you have someone with a kidney failure, if you have someone with a little bit of liver problem, then using a short acting glipizide is a better choice. Glimiparide, gliclazide, glibinparide, they're a little longer acting. So they will leave the body later and lead to a higher chance of hypoglycemia with someone with a kidney dysfunction. So keep these little things in mind. Pyoglitazone, yes, also conserves beta cell function, doesn't have hypoglycemia, but does lead to a little weight gain and can lead to some osteoporosis, some edema. DPP-4 these days working pretty well in most of my patients and most other diabetologists will find. Uh, they started off discussing up with Sita and Saxa, so they're mostly safe. In renal failure, you might need to reduce the dose a bit, but not too much. 
But the problem is that they are definitely a little more expensive than sulfonylureas. So if your patient can afford it, maybe you can start with a DPV-4. So this is a very, very busy chart and you'll get it on the ADA site. But bottom line, what they are telling us is we start with metformin. We start with lifestyle modification that continues. We start with discussions about diet and exercise. And then based on the patient profile, we decide on what medicine to use next. Now, SGLT2 inhibitors have proven a lot of uh, benefit with someone who has heart failure or is prone to heart failure. So that is one thing we can keep in mind. Problems with SGLT2 inhibitors is, yes, it can lead to a little bit of UTI and genital infection because the fact that the sugar is being pushed out of the urine and the milieu of uh, high sugar uh, urine can be around, but with good hygiene, these days it's not that much of a problem. SGLT2 also helps with weight loss, and most patients we find need to lose a little bit of weight. Um, with sulfonylureas, yes, there is hypoglycemia, but when you want to consider cost and access, you can use sulfonylurea, but keep your patients aware of the dose, keep the patients aware of the fact that they need to eat when they're taking the medicine and also give them a little idea that yes if you feel a little low a little down if you have a glucometer check it or just if possible if, if you really feel like you're sweating you're having a hypoglycemia episode then tell them what they need to do to correct it. same for patients on insulin so teach your insulin patients teach your sulfonylurea patients about hypoglycemia and what to do when they find it but sometimes what happens is that because of the sphere of hypoglycemia the entire treatment goes off schedule so Personally, I prefer starting with metformin, adding a DP before an SGLT2, depending on what I'm getting. But again, individualize, individualize on what your patient can afford. Right? I have these days again, the DPP4s have become a lot cheaper than what they were to start with. And tenalegleptin is actually almost as cheap as um, sulfonylurea. So you can consider that. So the goal of care, we need to keep on going in this cycle at a check up, assess the patient characteristics, what lifestyle do they have, what possible comorbidities can they have or do they have, look at how old they are, how their weight is at the moment, their BMI, how much the HbA1c is, what target do you want, do they have a problem in being motivated to take care of themselves, is there a sign of depression, because diabetes tends to come with depression and once the patient finds out they have a chronic progressive disease, the depression worsens and then the treatment is hampered because of that, and then there's cultural and socioeconomic context. Uh, someone who cannot take meals on time or for some social reason, something is happening. So you need to look into those little keys. Look at uh, specific factors that impact your choice of treatment. So every patient is individual. Look at what their HbA1c is. Look at how the medicine that you give impacts their weight and might give them more hypoglycemia. Look at the side effect. You look at someone who already has a swollen foot and you give them something which that increases further. The pyoglitosin will cause more trouble. See, always try to give the most simple regimen of medicines. Half tablet of this, one tablet of that, one and a half of this, five times a day, three times a day. It's very complicated. So try and give them the easiest possible regimen of medicines and see if that works or not first. And then later on, you might increase and decide on what happens next. Make it a shared plan. Ask the patient if they would be comfortable taking it. So you tell someone to take a medicine at lunchtime and that poor person goes to office every day and can never remember to take the lunchtime medicine or the lunchtime is so varied that there's no point in taking the medicine at that odd time. So in that particular patient, if you could give some long acting treatment, something at the morning, something at night and skipping lunch entirely, both at home, both medicines at home, that works. If you're going to give them a treatment plan, talk about SMART goals. I will talk about those here. And implement a plan that needs to be met. So you need to be checking regularly, seeing how it is, and looking at the ongoing monitoring support. If the patient is doing well emotionally, how the patient is tolerating the treatment and the medicines, tolerating, looking at the glycemic status, and at every checkup, review the plan. So... As a continuous comprehensive diabetes care plan, you need regular follow-ups. You need to reach the target BMI. The blood pressure needs to be kept on target. 
check the lipids, making sure the LDL, the bad cholesterol, is, again, I'm not talking at all about total cholesterol. Look at the LDL, the low density lipoprotein. Look at the HDL, the high density lipoprotein and the triglycerides. Measure HbA1c every three months. Try to keep it as much as possible on target. But while keeping an HbA1c target, don't be too strict when someone is elderly or has other comorbidities that can lead to hypoglycemia or other reasons for dizziness and fainting. Have a thorough foot examination every time and have a monofilament and vibratory testing annually. There should be a kidney evaluation with EGFR calculation, which you can do very easily from the creatinine these days and look for proteinuria and microalbuminuria. Have an annual eye checkup with uh, the help of an ophthalmologist with a dilated fundoscopic examination. An ECG once a year and if required a 2D echo and discuss about vaccines because uh, diabetics might be more prone to having flu or pneumonia and that's why you need to discuss about this to review the lifestyle and diet and exercise plan at every checkup and discuss about the addiction if necessary for that particular patient.